Uh, so tonight's talk, as I introduced this morning, is uh, a fairly uh, big classic, which the Buddha explains his whole path. Some of you perhaps have heard it before. And this is uh, the second discourse from the Long Discourses, the first book of the suttas. And the first sutta of, these, of this book, the one right before him, so the, the first sutta of the whole canon, is a bit advanced, very advanced. And so the second sutta onward, and the twelve suttas, the twelve discourses that follow after this, uh, all use the same sequence, which you will hear tonight. This is uh, an extract from this sutta, because these suttas are fairly long, and so I will spare you the whole thing, but you will get just the core, the essence of that path that the Buddha used very, very often to explain to others what his teaching was. And we can consider this sutta, which is called the Fruits of the Truth Seeking Life, the Samanya Palla Sutta. It's a, it's a quite uh, big classic. And we can consider this sutta almost as the first one of, of the Sutta Pitaka. Of course, there's one before that, but this one really begins gives a clear, the first one is, is talking about all kinds of uh, opinions and views and it's fairly complex. So you already need to know the Buddha's teaching before you read the first sutta. But this sutta here is really when this, all the suttas really start where um, we get our first dip into what it is that the Buddha taught this whole path and it is quite wonderful going from the appearance of a Buddha which is in itself extremely rare in this universe and world and uh, that discovers this uh, there's so many suttas that say the Buddha says even hearing the word Buddha in his in one's lifetime is extremely fortunate. It's extremely rare to come upon this kind of um, this teaching. There are much more, much more time in this on this planet, on, in this universe, where there's no Buddha. <laughs> much, much more. And so we are very fortunate to get this. And um, and how one um, comes upon and hears about the Dhamma and feels uh, interested and takes on the training. And this explains through the virtue and then um, uh, the, all the wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood. Uh, it is not mentioned directly, but this is exactly what it talks about. And then it goes into uh, right um, practice or wise practice and wise awareness how to be aware, what is that wise awareness, samma sati, that he taught, and what is this wise practice, samma vayamo, uh, that he taught. And these culminate in the jhanas, in wise liberation afterwards. So wise, wise samadhi and then wise liberation. And so we will get a glimpse at all of this and It's good to really let your mind soak completely this, this discourse. This is the whole of the path. And many people hearing this uh, kind of discourse uh, understood the Dhamma or got a very profound insight on oh, what it is actually that the Buddha taught. So I hope you enjoy. And this is with 
King Ajata Sattu. So this, these long discourses, they were often uh, taught to kings or uh, high Brahmin priests who knew the Vedas and all these. And this is with King Ajata Sattu. And the introduction which I am uh, skipping because it's, it's fairly lengthy. So here uh, the king is uh, on his uh, veranda on top of his palace with all of his ministers and it's the full moon night, the observance night, Uposata. And he feels very inspired and he, he wants to seek spiritual advice, which is very, very common at that time. This is, this is what they did. They didn't go to movie theaters. They went to <laughs> spiritual masters. <laughs> so, and so uh, all of his ministers, they all, they all uh, suggest him. Uh, oh, you could go to see this one, this one, and this one. And he's like, no, not really interested. And because he's been to all of them. And then Jivaka says, one of his ministers, well, there's the Buddha fully awakened in my mango grove staying there right now. <laughs> uh, your majesty could come and pay a visit. And so he chooses to do this. And he says, um, harness the, elef the elephants and we will go. <laughs> so the, this is how the sutta starts. And so they, they arrive and he's very impressed at, at the audience. All of the monks, there's uh, hundreds of monks. And they're all very, very, very quiet. And this is very rare at that time. Usually um, it's about debating. Usually people would gather and debate their ideas. And the Buddha had a different crowd. They were known to be very quiet and very still. So he's fairly impressed. And then he arrives to the Buddha and asks his question. Dear Bhante, there are various professions and crafts such as chefs, barbers and soap makers, cooks, gardeners and dyers, weavers, reed workers and potters, translators and accountants, and all those with similar professions and skills. They live by the visible fruit of their professions. They themselves happily enjoy this. Their mothers and fathers happily enjoy this. Their children and wives happily enjoy this. Their friends and relatives happily enjoy this. They can thereby support the spiritual life and offer to wandering seekers and Brahmins. Like I was saying yesterday, uh, what I, when I was talking about samanas and brahmanas, basically at this time, at that time period, uh, when the Buddha was in India, this was very, very common in the going forth, becoming a monk, or really devoting oneself to the spiritual life was very, very common. It was expected that when uh, wandering uh, ascetics or monks would come by your place the people it was expected it was known it was the tradition the culture that they would be offered uh, a place to stay uh, food for the day or for however they they needed to stay or rest or water and so this is very much part of that culture at that time they stand in what is divine, in what is happy, what, in what has a happy result, in what is conducive to the celestial abodes. Bhante, is it possible to reveal any visible fruit of the truth-seeking life? And this is also a theme that we come upon nowadays quite a lot. Why do you meditate? Why do you do this? And this is a very good discourse, which tells there are many fruits why we do this. It is possible, great king, listen carefully and apply your mind to what I say. Yes, Bande, replied the king. The awakened one said this, Great king, 
A truth finder arises in the world, a Buddha, a Narahant, perfectly all awakened, endowed with righteous knowledge and righteous behavior. This was the fame of the Buddha, was that he practiced what he taught. A blissful one, knower of the world's unsurpassed guide for those who seek peace. Teacher of devas and humans, awakened and exalted. He teaches the Dhamma which is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the ending, in the meaning and the phrasing. And he embodies and shines forth the completely perfected and utterly pure spiritual life. Then this Dhamma is heard by someone, reborn in any family or country. Having heard this Dhamma, that person acquires faith in the Buddha. And here the gradual training starts. And one takes on the training. One lives self-mastered and protected by the Patimoka, the rules of conduct, continually living in righteous behavior, seeing danger in the smallest lapse of attention, undertaking the training in virtue, skillfully conducted in physical and verbal actions, completely pure in living and good in nature, watchful over the doors of one's sense faculties, possessed of presence and full awareness, happy and content. How is a seeker good in nature? One abandons hurting living beings. One turns away from hurting living beings. With neither stick nor sword, one lives considerate and kind, friendly and compassionate towards all living beings. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons the taking of what is not given. One turns away from taking what is not given. Taken only what is offered, expecting only what is offered. One lives without stealing, with inner purity. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons sexual misbehavior. One lives content and at peace, not obsessed by physical attraction. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons speaking lies. One turns away from speaking lies. One is known to speak the truth, filled with the truth, firm and trustworthy, not a deceiver of the world. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons hurtful speech. One turns away from hurtful speech. One does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide the people here. And one does not repeat here what one has heard elsewhere in order to divide, to divide the people elsewhere. One is a unifier of those who are divided, a promoter of those who are united. One enjoys harmony, delights in harmony, rejoices in harmony. One speaks praise of making peace and harmony. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons coarse speech. One turns away from coarse speech, speaking with words that are polished, pleasant to, to the ear, loving, going to the heart and civilized, endearing and loved by many. Such are the words that one speaks. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons meaningless talk. One turns away from meaningless talk. One is a speaker of words that are timely, factual and meaningful, a speaker of Dhamma, a speaker of Vinaya. 
These are the rules of conduct. One speaks for the purpose of laying down the burden. Words that are appropriate, reasoned, well-defined, in connection with the meaning. This constitutes one's good nature. One turns away from injuring the seed kingdom and the plant kingdom. One is a one-meal eater, not eating in the evening. One turns away from eating at improper times. And this is known to be the shorter section on virtue. Then there is the middle section on virtue. And then there is the long section on virtue, which I am all skipping here because this is more towards uh, monk practice. But you just heard the core of it, really. In this way, great king, for a seeker of good nature, there is no fear arising from anywhere, since one is protected by one's virtue. Just as for a highly celebrated king of the ruling caste, who has conquered his enemies in the four directions, there is no fear arising from anywhere, and he lives protected by his conquest. In the same way for the good-natured seeker, there is no fear arising from anywhere, because one is protected by one's own virtue. Following this entire body of Aryan virtuous behavior, one experiences within oneself a completely blameless happiness. In this way, great king, a seeker is of good nature. And here we start the training on meditation, samadhi. And this starts with wise awareness and the mastery of the sense faculties. Sometimes the Buddha explained wise awareness as the four resting places of awareness, the satipatthanas. But also sometimes he explained it as the six senses. And this is the format that he is using here tonight. How is a seeker, a gatekeeper of one's sense faculties? Seeing a shape with the eye, one does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. Because if one were to live with the visual faculty unprotected, longing, then impatience, and unskillful, unwholesome states would take over one's mind. See, this is how all distractions arise. And this is a beautiful pointer. <laughs> this universal phenomena. Thus, one practices for its mastery. One protects the visual faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the visual faculty. Hearing a sound with the ear, one does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. If one were to live with the auditive faculty unprotected, longing then in patience, and unskillful uns unwholesome states would take over one's mind. Thus one practices for its mastery. One protects the auditive faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the auditive faculty. Smelling an odor with the nose. One does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. And how do we do this? By letting it go, by relaxing by not keeping our attention on it. it. We do what we need to do, and then we just let it go. We relax. If one were to live with the olfactive faculty unprotected, longing, impatience, and unskillful, unwholesome states could take over one's mind. Thus one practices for its mastery, one protects the olfactive faculty. 
one becomes skilled regarding the olfactive faculty. Tasting a flavor with the tongue or touching a tangible with the body, one does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. If one were to do to live with the body faculty unprotected, longing or impatience and unskillful, unwholesome states would take over one's mind. Thus, one practices for its mastery. One protects the body faculty. One becomes skilled regarding, regarding the body faculty. Aware of a mental object with the mind. One does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. The Buddha explained mind as simply one more sense. It is the governing one, but it works in the same way. And we, when we engage and indulge in the mind in thinking, thinking, thinking. It works in the same way. If one were to live with the mind faculty unprotected, longing, then impatience and unskillful unwholesome states could take over one's mind. Thus one practices for its mastery. One protects the mental faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the mental faculty. Possessing this awakened self-mastery, one experiences within oneself a happiness that is completely blameless. This is how a seeker is a gatekeeper of one's own sense faculties. Now presence and full awareness. How is a seeker present and fully aware? One is fully conscious while going forward and coming back. One is fully conscious looking ahead and looking down. One is fully conscious moving and extending one's body. One is fully conscious wearing the Sangati. This is the third robes of the monks. One's bowl and one's robes. One is fully conscious while eating, drinking, chewing, swallowing. One is fully conscious while evacuating and urinating. One is fully conscious while walking, standing, sitting, sleeping and waking up, talking and keeping silent. This is how a seeker is present and fully aware. This means continually staying with whatever theme of development that we cultivate to uphold our mindfulness and to let go of any distractions that arise. And this is how we become sampajanga, fully aware, because we're not distracted. How is a seeker content? One is happy with robes to cover one's body, with alms food to satisfy one's stomach. Where, wherever one goes, one sets out, taking only these with him. Just as birds, wherever they fly, take nothing but their wings and fly with themselves as only burden. In the same way, one is happy with robes to cover one's body, with alms food to satisfy one's stomach. Wherever one goes, one sets out, taking only these things. This is how, great king, a seeker is content. Following the entire body of, Arya's, of the Arya's good conduct, Possessing the Arya's mastery of the sense faculties, endowed with the Arya's presence and full awareness, attain to this Arya's contentment. One resorts to a secluded dwelling, to the forest, at the root of a tree, on a hillside, in some cave, 
a refuge in the mountain, a, far, a forest hut, in the open air or on a pile of straw. After having eaten, returning from alms round, one sits down with legs folded and one's body upright, settling down one attends with presence about oneself. And now we go into wise practice, which is actually letting go of the hindrances. Abandoning longing for external things, dwelling with a mind void of longing, one's mind is cleansed from longing. Abandoning hostility and anger, one dwells with a mind rid of hostility, with a heartfelt compassion towards all beings that live. One's mind is cleansed from hostility and anger leaving behind laziness and dullness of mind, dwelling with a mind void of laziness nor dullness, perceiving clearly, present and fully aware. One, one's mind is cleansed from dull laziness, leaving behind agitation and worry. One dwells uplifted with an inwardly relieved mind, One's mind is cleansed from agitation and worry. Leaving behind perplexity, one dwells unperplexed, rid of uncertainty towards what is good. One's mind is cleansed from perplexity. And these are all five hindrances we all treat in the same way. And interestingly, this doubt when we have this doubt arising, oh, it's not working. This is, in fact, a hindrance. We simply need to let it go like all the other ones. Just as if one were freed from debt, freed from illness. Just as if someone was in debt, sorry, sick, imprisoned, in servitude, on a wild desert journey. This is how a seeker perceives carrying around the five hindrances within oneself. Just as if one were freed from debt, freed from illness, freed from jail, freed from slavery, having come upon a heaven on this earth. This is how a seeker perceives the letting go of the five hindrances within oneself. And here, this wise samadhi that is born of happiness, growing increasingly aware of the melting away of these five hindrances, gladness arises. From that gladness, joy arises in the mind. With a joyful mind, the body becomes calm. With a calm body, one experiences happiness and the happy mind becomes collected. Then the jhanas, letting go of all outward desires and letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and imagining with joyful happiness born of letting go. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. There are suttas where the Buddha gives the instructions for the Brahma Viharas just before this and also right be after this. So this is all possible to be practiced with the Brahma Viharas. So this is very directly related to our practice. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. One immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with this joyful happiness born of letting go. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this joyful happiness born of letting go. Imagine a skilled soap maker who would throw some soap powder into a copper bowl. He would sprinkle it with water and knead it thoroughly. Then after some time, the lump of soap 
would be filled and suffused by moisture through and through, everywhere touched by the moisture, yet it would not leak. In the same way one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with this joyful happiness born of letting go. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this joyful happiness born of letting go. This is a visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great king, beyond and more exalted than all the previous ones. With the calming of thinking and reflection, with the inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified, without thinking nor reflection, with the joyful happiness of collected mental harmony, one understands and dwells in the second level of meditation. Then one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with this joyful happiness born of mental, collected mental harmony. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this joyful happiness born of mental collectedness. Imagine a deep lake with water only welling up from within, with no other source flowing in, not from the east nor from the west, from the north nor from the south, with no rain at any time, from that cool water spring gushing up from within. That lake would become immersed, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this fresh and cool water, and nowhere in this entire lake would be left untouched by this cool spring water. In the same way, great king, one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with this joyful happiness born of mental collectedness, samadhi. So that nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this joyful happiness born of collected mental harmony. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great king, which is beyond and more exalted than all of the previous ones. With the calming of stronger joy, one abides in mental steadiness present and fully aware, experiencing ease within one's body, a state which the awakened ones describe as steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. Then, great king, one immerses, permeates, suffuses and pervades one's body with that happiness beyond stronger joy. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this happiness beyond stronger joy. Imagine water lilies, Indian lotuses and white lotuses, some of these water lilies and lotuses are born in the water, grown in the water, not risen above the, the water, nourished while completely immersed. From their very tip down to their roots, submerged, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this cool water, so that no part of those water lilies, Indian lotuses, or white lotuses is left untouched by cool water. In the same way, one immerses, permeates, suffuses, and pervades one's body with that happiness beyond bliss. 
and nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this happiness beyond bliss. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great king, which is beyond and more exalted than all of the previous ones. Then, unattached to pleasant sensations, unstirred by unpleasant experiences, with the earlier settling of excitement and disturbances, balanced and steady, purified by unmoving presence of mind, one understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. This is where the metta becomes very, very, very subtle and very steady, very easy to sustain. Just before we start feeling bodily awareness fade away and we notice that now there is much more emphasis on only mind. One sits with one's body suffused with the bright purity of one's own spotless mind. And nowhere in one's body is left untouched by this bright purity of one's own spotless mind. Imagine a man or a woman was sitting wrapped up to the head with a sparkling white cloth so that nowhere on one's entire body would be left untouched by this sparkling white cloth. In the same way, one sits with one's body fused with that bright purity of one's own spotless mind. And nowhere in one's entire body is left untouched by this bright purity of one's own spotless mind. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great king, which is beyond this and more exalted than the previous ones. And now the final part of the training in discernment. And this is wise understanding and wise thinking. The calming of all distractions. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become soft and malleable, straight and unwavering, one directs and inclines one's mind to the complete calming of all distractions. One understands distractions as they really are. This is tension. This is the origin of the tension. This is the release from tension. This is how to release the tension. One understands distractions as they really are. These are distractions. This is the increase of the distractions. This is the release from the distraction. This is how to release the distractions. And wise liberation. Continually observing and understanding in this way, one's mind is released from the inclination for clinging outwardly, from the inclination to projecting in the future, and from the inclination to negligence. In that release, one knows this is release. One directly knows the birth of new unwholesome states is overcome. Lived is the spiritual life. Done is what had to be done. There is no more conceit here. This is yet another visible fruit of the truth-seeking life, great king, 
And in regards to the fruits of the truth-seeking life, there are none beyond or more exalted than this one. Once this was spoken, the king Ajatasattu of Magadha exclaimed, Excellent, Bhante, excellent! Just as if what had fallen over been set upright, or as what had been hidden was just uncovered, or as if the way was shown to someone who was lost, or as if a light was shone in the darkness, thinking, let those with vision see. In the same way, Bhante, the awakened one has brought forth and elucidated the Dhamma in countless ways. Bhante, I go to the awakened one as a refuge, to the Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. May the awakened one count me as a lay follower from now on who has gone for refuge for life. And this is how this wonderful discourse ends. And de depending on the audience here, the King Ajatasattu unfortunately had committed one of the highest crimes <laughs> and um, committed the murder of his own father, the King Bimbisara, who was a very devout man, very virtuous man, and um, the Buddha explains afterwards that the King Ajatasattu's mind would have seen the Dhamma and entered the stream right there and then listening to this Dhamma discourse if he had not committed that act because his mind was sullen with uh, remorse and it was completely, uh, it was uh, very heavy. And that's what happens when we commit very, uh, very, um, very unwholesome deeds. And uh, the, the murdering of uh, father or mother is considered one of the, the highest crimes, which follows for many, 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 many lifetimes. <laughs> So uh, the impact on the mind of such an act is very um, uh, profound. But in the next 11 and 12 suttas, um, if, I'm, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, many, many people upon hearing this exact discourse with uh, always with including the context of their situation, uh, see the Dhamma, plunge into the Dhamma, and uh, have this, uh, the, the Dhamma Chakku arise. And this is a very good sutta to keep along with us and to remember, because this is very um, close uh, this is as close as we can get to uh, an explanation, a very complete explanation, exactly how the Buddha explained his own path. So this is uh, quite a fundamental teaching. And I hope you, you enjoyed it. And we've been uh, polishing and purifying our minds for four days and so I thought this would this is a good time to hear this and then also now knowing this we can build a little bit more and learn a few more things which are we're slowly incrementally uh, getting there <laughs> learning more and more about different aspects very important aspects of this wonderful teaching do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Bhante, for 
to talk this evening. Um, I'm both wondering about the connection between the gladdened mind and the Satipatthanas. And is there always an emphasis on the gladdened mind before observing the Satipatthanas, or sometimes it just you're just observing the Satipatthanas? perhaps not with that emphasis. Yes. Yes, you're touching a, at a very, um, uh, a very important aspect of what is uh, how, how um, the Satipatthanas are being practiced right now, nowadays, and um, how um, the Buddha actually taught these uh, four resting places of awareness or the f foundations of mindfulness and the problem and w one of the reasons why I take I take my time <laughs> to before I get into the Satipatthanas because the Satipatthanas are in my opinion uh, there is way too much emphasis on the Satipatthanas right now in the teaching and not enough emphasis on right effort which comes right before that. And the way that we observe properly, and this is a tricky word because what has happened over time is that this thing about one-pointed mindfulness and here we're, we're learning a different approach. We're actually learning to move away from forcing the mind because we're learning here that this is actually creating tension. We're forcing, uh, for example, awareness on, let's say, sensations in the body, like really looking at that intentionally. This is a slight misunderstanding because the Satipatthanas, that's why I translate them as the resting places of awareness, is that they happen all the time. We don't actually need to direct our minds to them. We, in fact, these four things, that's what happens when we let go of everything. So we don't need to direct our mind to these things. They just happen. And this is easier understood uh, when we've practiced the Brahma Viharas and the highway with, uh, to, uh, to Nibbana or to deeper stages of meditation where we can take mind as mind. And that's a Satipatthana. But we've really built this, uh, because like we discussed today, uh, this, this natural joy that is embedded in the metta. In fact, metta comes with joy. These two things are not completely separate. There's a way they are separate, but there's a way that they're actually really together. And the metta, it shapes up our mind very quickly into it puts it in a very very wholesome state right away and yes it requires that effort but it is an effort that is uplifting the mind and the reason why I put so much emphasis on that gladness and on that joy is that this sequence comes back very often but it is completely over not completely but almost completely overlooked and to be honest I haven't heard any teachers talk about this sequence really and pulled it out of the suttas and really you know talking about this sequence that is so important and it comes back just before the jhanas every time and um, we need to understand this to understand how to meditate because the satipatthanas they they happen with that the, the satipatthanas they're just our experience 
all the time. When we let go of all distractions all the time, we're aware of some satipatthana or another. Whether it's the body we begin with. For example, if I sit here, I close my eyes, and I, uh, if I were, and this, I believe I will, we will see, see this sutta, the Anapanasati Sutta, on this retreat which is another very uh, important sutta to know about, especially the Satipatthanas, but the seven supports of awakening too. And if I sit here, I relax all the tension, like it is said in the Anapanasati, for example. I bring up joy, bring up happiness, like it is said in the Anapanasati which is a direct instruction on how to practice the Satipatthanas. The Buddha e explains that very clearly in that sutta. It's hard for me not to be aware of body. <laughs> it's actually impossible. It's impossible for me to not be aware of body because it's, it's just there. So why force this awareness? It's, it's, it's simply come up. It simply comes up. It's there. And in fact, we discovered that as we let go of all distractions, of all of the things that are happening in the mind, we start to realize we become very aware and like clear awareness of this body without us doing anything about it. It just is. Because that's the nature of, that's why they're called the resting places of awareness. This is where the awareness lands when it, isn't distracted so and they work in many different ways and so the gladness is very important because gladness or joy and letting go they come together and they will bring the mind to jhana and talking about this is is to talking about uh, the Satipatthanas also because there is the thing is that in the stock definition of the Satipatthanas for example one is aware uh, meditates aware of body as body uh, intent fully aware and present uh, letting go of distractions and tension that's how I translate it There is no mention of, of joy, for example, or gladness. But that's because that's not the place to look for it. That's not where the Buddha explains it. And this is misunderstood too often. And the joy is very clearly uh, explained in this sequence. Uh, and it is explained again in the jhanas, which follow right after. It is explained very clearly in the seven supports of awakening, which are very important teaching uh, that the Buddha talked a lot about. And this sequence here talks literally about the seven supports of awakening. It just doesn't mention that name, but it talks about them very clearly. And so, To understand how the mind is uplifting, up uplifted through gladness and joy, and by letting go. That is how the satipatthanas become clear and present and bright and very uh, evident. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> Maybe I could relate just a small happening that, that was uh that happened today i was um i was just i was just doing dishes and uh i was just quite aware of what was going on and i was just sort of like very aware of like my senses and just like everything that was going around me and then i was like oh you know what i should i should be bringing up joy here and bringing this into the in, into it and then i was just like i wasn't sure if i was just adding something more that didn't need to be there in that moment. So I wasn't sure because I know the idea you bring up joy and then it, it creates awareness and then it was sort of backwards. So I was just like, oh, am I doing this right? Or 
Yes, yes. Well, that's a, that's a really good observation. And uh, you're, it's, it's always, um, and that's why, that's why uh, we praise really undertaking, for example, the metta completely with everything that you do. There's no stop. Whenever you stand up from sitting, it, you're, you're still meditating. Like you still should be generating co continually. Not, not like forcing, forcing. You can, you can walk around in jhana. That is, that is not really a problem. The thing is that once we start engaging in so many things, then that's when we, we start. The trick is to maintain this awareness and do these things w being mindful of our sense faculties, being mindful that we don't, you know, we don't, really scrub that plate and forget or have that song in our head or something like that just just continually with the metta and that will support our awareness and that joy like you're saying if you bring up that joy the thing is that the mind is finicky you think that you're aware but you're you're having these little thoughts <laughs> and you're not you're not seeing it. Whereas when your mind is completely imbued in loving kindness, for example, or completely devoted to it, a hundred percent, then that makes sure that there is not a space possible in your mind for it to go like, oh, there's this and that and that song. And because that's, it's, it's hard. It, it's really, it's not, it's not easy to... It's very, very subtle. That's the thing. And that's what we will start to see more and more on this meditation retreat. As we move deeper and deeper in the meditation, the mind is very, very, very subtle. So that's a very good observation. And the joy, if you want to cultivate joy, for example, if that's where you are in your meditation, and be... I, I suggest continually, if you're with the metta, continually go with the metta. And then as it will go down, uh, as it will calm down and we go through the other Brahma Viharas, then we take these as vehicle, but we never stop really. And if you're with joy, uh, continually bringing up joy will make sure that you're continually aware. So that is a very good observation, yes. <laughs> Good. Good. I just wanted to say that um, the the questions and answers they're uh, they're not mandatory. And if it's late for you and uh, you you feel like taking a rest, it's completely fine. Questions and answers just open. If you want to ask a question, you can. If you if you want to prefer leaving, it's fine too. I just don't want people to to feel bad. It's no problem at all. <laughs> and I know also for a future, you know, the, these retreats, they will be, uh, I don't know, online and things. I don't know how it's going to happen, but <laughs> I really don't want people to feel like they they have to do something that they don't want. Yes. Pante, thank you for the talk. It was beautiful, Sita. Um, I'm wondering, I know that the um, different levels don't really matter. They blend from one to the next. But I'm interested in the, the analogy or the metaphor that's used for the third and the fourth. It seems to me that the, the suffused... Mm, water lilies where the whole outside is completely suffused by water is very similar in a way to being completely covered by a sparkling white cloth and i'm just sometimes the differentiation that's made between the third and the fourth jhana seems very um well it's really fine compared to 
the second Jono, which is really very clear, but <laughs> that one. So just if you wanted to speak a little bit more about um, the differentiation, even though I am aware that it it doesn't have to be a firm line. Yes. Well, that is a very good question. And... Um, The main thing, well, usually what is said is that um, in the third in the third jhana we begin to have this um, this new experience of what is called upeka, and um, that's another very often misunderstood. Uh, aspect because upeka is uh, often translated as equanimity and I think you've all heard my talks but uh, uh, equanimity it, it's not that the kind of equanimity that I would tell you don't move you ha you're experiencing a lot of pain don't move stay equanimous <laughs> that's not the equanimity that we're talking about here not at all actually this is a kind of forced equanimity and it can there are some ways that it is in this practice in the higher training like to become an anagami or arahant but at that level the it's also different because there's so much mental steadiness these feelings they don't really come up as they're not the same so we're just really purifying the mind to a really another level but the equanimity that is discussed here and which begins at the third jhana. And that's why they say um, a state which is which the aryas, the aryas is refers to the arya pugalas, the awakened people, the uh, four levels of awakening, which are stream entry, once returner, non returner, and arahant, who is fully awakened. So in in the Buddha's teaching in the early texts, these were the four, um, when we speak about awakening, for example, or, well, it, the Buddha said this is a gradual process, it is a gradual training. So awakening, there is a, you know, the awakening of a Buddha, for example, is different than the awakening of his disciples. And he said there's four levels of these and the first is, we will, I will speak more about each of them further along. But this is a very interesting thing. And these four people, the one, one thing that characterizes them is that they've experienced and understood and lived the Dhamma in such a way. And they've, they've, uh, what they say about this upeka, this mental because I translate upeka as mental steadiness, because upeka means uh, comes from upa ishka. Ishka ishka is to see. Upa is like on on looking. So it's it's steadily looking or <laughs> steady presence of mind. So it's not so much as being equanimous. Yes, that happens with steadiness of mind or having a balanced mind. But it's more about <clears throat> this is where we start to have this insight because as I was saying, these jhanas, each of them are insights into how the mind works. And at the third jhana, we start experiencing that bliss of upeka. And this, and this is why I'm saying all of this, the differentiation between that forced equanimity and what I'm talking about, which is a steadiness of mind, which comes from wholesome mental development through joy, uplifting the mind and letting go of distractions, which is a very different ballgame. <laughs> it's completely different. And this kind of steadiness of mind that the Aryas 
describe and this is where they draw their happiness is the bliss of mental development and there is great great happiness in steadiness of mind now in those two similes the difference one thing that I see is that these lotuses uh, it's it's it fe it feels rich it feels um, a, a little bit more lush you know there's there is still that experiencing happiness within one's body or ease within one's body but at the fourth the um, this the mental steadiness and the bliss because we have to say that mental steadiness is not just mental steadiness it's very very blissful but it's hard to describe it's not it's not exa excited bliss it's just really wonderful steadiness steady awareness and the fourth one with the sparkling white cloth that is covering the whole body which feels a bit more like the same as the lotuses um, there is not much because there is not really m much more attention towards um, bodily experiences and that and the thing that happens here also and that this is going into the deeper teaching a bit of the higher jhanas the arupa jhanas but it is usually understood that the arupa jhanas the formless jhanas the mental jhanas that start after the fourth jhana because these first four jhanas levels of meditation they are known as the rupa jhana rupa means form or uh, bodily uh, material so we are still aware of the body through these four jhanas but the fourth one is see that sparkling white cloth is the awareness is so purified and bright and for example the Buddha was very uh, keen on awareness of the body as a vehicle of awareness he that was that is one of the and it is a satipatthanas but he also explains it as just awareness of the body too without the other satipatthanas and so there's many ways the Buddha explains his meditation but here if we take this particular uh, awareness of the body as a vehicle for example and at that stage at the fourth level of meditation there is really just this really clear awareness just bright awareness of of body but very 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 subtle is simply it simply is because there's no distractions in the mind the mind is completely steady and it is also understood usually that the arupa jhanas the formless jhanas are part of the fourth rupa jhana so here things that's where things start to become a little different so that's why we can't really say oh exactly uh, because at this point this is also where bodily awareness will start we're, we're going to start to lose interest in it it's still going to be there if we look at it but mental collectedness becomes so so much stronger than that sparkling white cloth even it it just fades or uh, and this is where where we um, go move into the mental realm more where things get more spacious because when there's no awareness of body which is solid and more uh, dense mind mind has no body mind has its only mind so it feels very spacious but this we will see in the further discourses i hope yes <laughs> good yes 
and the Buddha, you know, he, who knows what he exactly meant by his wonderful similes. They're just beautiful. <laughs> we just, I feel like, uh, often I feel like his, his similes are just this, this gift or this, you know, he's just giving you this beautiful image to uplift the mind even more. <laughs> so that's how I see it. Good. Very good, very good. So let's share some merits and we will go our own way. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya sokha patta chani sokha Hondu sabbe pi pani no Irang no punyang ab sabbe satta nu morantu Sabba sambati siddhya Aga satta cha bhumata Deva naga mahidika Punyang tang anu moritwa Chirang rakantu buddha sasasanang May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired, for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana Sadhu Sadhu.